Greetings, urban farmers, gardeners, and healthy food visionaries. Farmer Greg here, and welcome to the 558th episode of the Urban Farm Podcast, where every day we work together to educate and inspire you to become part of your food revolution. If you're listening to this podcast, then you know the value of life-giving, fresh, homegrown food. The truth is, we weren't meant to eat processed foods or lifeless produce that was flown in from thousands of miles away, taking days or even weeks to reach our plates. In March, Urban Farm U hosted our first Edible Backyard Summit, a free online event designed to bring thousands of people together to learn about growing food in our yards. People loved it so much that I decided to offer it again. I've teamed up with some amazing gardening visionaries to share their knowledge this September. When you attend our free online summit, you'll get access to all four days of knowledge from food growing experts and have an opportunity to get your most burning garden questions answered live. Just like in March, we're going to air four modules of our comprehensive Growing Food the Basics course so that you can dig deeply into fundamental concepts that will set you up for success no matter where you're at in your food growing journey. I hope you'll dig in and join us for this transformative event. Plus, by attending the summit and sharing it with your friends, you will be part of the Grow Your Own Food Revolution. To sign up, visit ediblebackyardsummit.com. And it would mean a lot to us if you could share the page far and wide with your friends on social media, in your garden clubs, and places we haven't even thought about. If you can't attend all of the classes live, you can still sign up. We offer replays and the ability to purchase an all-access pass that gives you lifetime access to the classes plus a package of bonuses that we've put together to say thanks and give you even more resources for creating your own edible yard. Are you ready to truly thrive with a healthy life and get connected with your food? live a more self-reliant life and feel secure knowing that you have a food supply right in your backyard. When you attend the Edible Backyard Summit, you'll be part of a community of people from all around the world that are all on the same mission to make their backyards and patios an edible paradise. Whether you're starting your first garden or maintaining an existing one, You will come out of this summit feeling revitalized and re-inspired to make growing and eating food the celebration it should be. Sign up for free by going to ediblebackyardsummit.com and I hope to see you there. Today on our podcast, we have someone who values a relationship with tiny garden workers. We're talking with returning guest Jason Johns about saving our bees. Jason is the author of Save Our Bees, your guide to creating a bee-friendly environment, as well as 17 other gardening books on everything from greenhouse gardening to growing giant pumpkins. Jason is passionate about gardening, having grown his own produce for over 20 years. He started with a second-hand greenhouse, an eight-by-six-foot patch in his mother's garden, and far too many tomato plants. Welcome back to the show, Jason. We've had you on a few times. And most recently, you've joined us for our Edible Backyard Summit. Always love our conversation. Let's talk bees. Excellent. Thank you for having me back, Craig. It's lovely to talk to you again. And uh, I am looking forward to chatting about bees with you. Super. So, you know, we've all heard a lot over the past 10 years about bees and bees being in trouble. How important are they as a species? Well, scientists reckon they're, they're fairly important. Let's just say... Uh, bees are, are responsible for pollinating probably about 70% of what we eat. Hold on, whoa, 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 whoa. 70%? They, they reckon about 70 That's conservative. They reckon it could be as high as maybe 80%. Wow. So they're a little bit more than fairly important, I think, right? Yeah. That, that's a bit <laughs> of a Brit- British understatement for you. Yes, there you they're, go. They're, they're absolutely vital to not just our existence, but the existence of obviously a lot of plants and animals that rely on fruit from the plants. So they, they are very, very important. And unfortunately, a lot of people just don't think about bees. Bees are those annoying things that buzz around you in the garden for a lot of people. Nobody, very few people actually really consider just how important bees are to life on this planet. Yeah. 
And what dangers are they facing? Well, like the rest of us, they're facing an awful lot of dangers. Uh, climate change is a big issue for them because obviously the seasons have changed. So flowers are coming out later, but the bees are still waking up at the same time. So they're struggling with flowers with heavy rains. Obviously, they can't get out and feed. And I think what the, the pollution as well, generated by cars, planes, and everything else, causes a problem. And herbicides and, then, and pesticides, I would bet. They're, they're probably the, the main issues. But together with those, it's this sort of philosophy of monoculture that farmers have. Now, obviously, you know, when we farm, you and I, we grow a, a row of potatoes, a row of strawberries, a row of leeks, and we grow lots of different plants. Whereas a farmer they'll go out and plant 800 acres of wheat or potatoes or something like that. So the bees only have that one thing to feed on. Now, if you went out and you just ate potatoes for six months, at the end of that six months, you probably wouldn't be very healthy. Um, so what scientists are starting to realise is that bees aren't getting a range of pollens, and that seems to be causing, they're not entirely sure how or why yet, but that seems to be causing some problems for the bees. Well, I guess if we ate only one thing always and ever, that probably wouldn't be too healthy for us. Absolutely, no. So, you know, whilst the farmers aren't going to change what they're doing, some farmers have started to plant uh, some flowers and flowering hedgerows. But I, I remember sort of 10, 20 years ago, when you drove past fields of wheat here in the UK, you'd see poppies in the field. It was, it was a common pairing. There'd be some poppies in with the, with the wheat. Whereas nowadays... I'm assuming maybe they've changed how they get the seeds or or they've changed the herbicides they use or something. But when you drive through past wheat fields, all you ever see now is wheat. It's very, very rare yeah. that you see sort of the red of poppies uh, accompanying them. So the the really the big impact is our lack of biodiversity. Yeah, I, I think that that's it. But you've got to think on an on an urban level, I mean, I live in an urban environment and very, very few houses where I live have flowers in the garden. When I first moved here, one of the, the big things I noticed was a lack of insects. And I, I did a survey last year. I, I, in the middle of summer, I walked around some of the houses and out of a couple of hundred houses I've walked past, there was maybe 10 that had something flowering in the garden. Mm hmm. And of course, in our back gardens now, a lot of us have artificial grass and decking. That's become very, very popular, which of course takes away from the environment, not just for bees, but for other insects too. How many kinds of bees are there? Because I think, you know, we know about the honeybee. And I think when people say bees, that's really what they think is a honeybee. And there's many other kinds. Most people would think of a honeybee or a bumblebee. The bumblebee is the big big buzzy bee that flies around that everyone goes it shouldn't really be able to fly but they reckon in across the world there's probably around about twenty five thousand different species of bee wow here in britain we we've only got about 250 different bees but over in america there's about four thousand different species of bee yeah what kinds are there well, they're, they're, there's a lot of different bees. They're normally split into two sort of groups, really. You've got the social bees, then they're the bees that build hives. So like honeybees, bumblebees, they, they all build hives. And one of the other ones that you, you may have heard of over in America is the Africanized honeybees. They're the, the dangerous bees, mm -hmm. that, and they also are a social bee. But then you've got solitary bees as well. And these don't build hives. They tend to live by themselves. They may live near each other so for example a lot of them will dig holes like mining bees will dig holes in the ground and you may find quite a few of them live in the same area but they don't form hives so things like carpenter bees are another one they live in wood so they will sort of gnaw through wooden houses and in decking the gardens and they're a more blue black color uh, you, you've got mining bees, leaf cutting bees, masonry bees. Masonry bees are very common in, in, in houses. Again, with the destruction of their natural environment, they're moving into people's homes and starting to you know, dig into their walls and, and uh, the wood of the house because there's nowhere else for them to live. They don't know any different, obviously. Yeah, it's wood. Mm. Well, and there there's bees that are 
almost microscopic all the way to bees that are, you know, the size of a quarter to a half dollar? Yeah, they, they, something like the uh, sweat bee is, is about, it, it can be as small as three millimeters. It, it wow. tends to fly around people's heads when you're out jogging or something like that and you're sweating, hence its name. But then the bumblebee can be sort of a good inch, two inches across. I mean, I saw one today and, you know, if, if I'd been younger, I'd have told you it was the size of a B-52 bomber. But it was uh, it was a good two inches across and was making a very, very loud buzzing noise. Yeah. Wow. So I'm looking at your book. It's uh, And I was telling you before we started, you do a really, really nice job of getting these books laid out and published. So I just really wanted to congratulate you about that. Thank you. One of the things I noticed in this recent book on bees is you have some facts about bees. And one of the facts that I just had to stop and say, whoa, hold on here, time out. Bee fact, to make one pound of honey, bees must gather nectar from around how many flowers? Oh, it's a lot. This number says two million flowers. That's a lot, a lot, a lot. That, that's a couple of flowers, isn't it? I mean, <laughs> it's, it's, it's the distance they fly and the fact that they can travel around all these flowers. And you can imagine in an urban area where there's each house might have half a dozen flowers or something like that. That means bees have to travel an awful long way to try and gather the honey that they need to survive. Mm -hmm. They do travel a lot. They do. They, they travel a surprisingly long distance. They're very, very clever bees in how they get around, particularly honeybees, I think we refer to here, is honeybees will travel somewhere around 90,000 miles, which is, to give you an idea, three times around the world Holy in order to make a pound of honey. Wow. Well, if you're collecting from two million flowers, yeah. That's a fair distance, yeah. I mean, I mean it's, it's a lot of work, and they're, they're very, very clever in how they can get around and find these flowers and come back again they they build like or they fly on certain runs so you'll see them leaving a hive and they'll fly down the path and then split off so it's absolutely fascinating insect it really is yeah and how soon do you think we would notice an impact if we lost the bees well it would be within sort of six to twelve months because we obviously have stocks of vegetables. There's warehouses with frozen vegetables in and potatoes and things like that. So it would take six to 12 months and then suddenly we'd, we'd realize that we didn't have the supplies there. And, you know, plants weren't producing the fruit or vegetables that we normally eat that rely on fertilization. What can we do as home gardeners to help out this, this bee situation there's quite a lot we can do. It varies from simply just planting flowers that bees can pollinate through to allowing some of the weeds to flower. I have dandelions in my vegetable patch and every year I let them flower and then once they finish flower, I deadhead them so that they don't spread the seeds. And all this does is this creates uh, an early season food source for the bees because the bees wake up about the end of March, or honeybees, about the end of March, and a lot of the other bees start coming out then looking for food. Mm -hmm. and there's not a lot of flowers around. Oh, yeah. But dandelions are one of the first ones to come up, and they're, they're, they're uh, considered a very, very important food for bees. And when I was talking to some of the beekeepers I know, they sort of, I, I said, oh, well, I've, I've, I'd left, them, left my dandelion heads for the bees, you know, because I hadn't weeded and made the place look nice. And they said, oh, that's, they told me that how good an idea it was and that the bees really appreciated it. So, you know, you can do things like that. Let the weeds flower and then just deadhead them afterwards because it all helps the bees. Yeah, wow. So that's one thing we can do. We can also build homes for them. We, we can help build homes for them because obviously bees need somewhere to live. And with their destruction of the habitat, they, they don't have anywhere to live. Now, you... You tend to build homes for solitary bees rather than for sort of honeybees. Honeybees live in hives or, or sort of nest in trees and everything else. You know, we, we're all familiar with honeybees because Winnie the Pooh has an ongoing relationship with them. <laughs> right. Uh, you, you know, so but solitary bees, they, they do need a nice, nice home. And it can be as simple as just leave a bare patch of soil in the corner of your garden 
and mining bees and they'll come in and dig holes and go and live in it. You can pile up dead branches. They're quite good. And again, bees will go and live in live in those. There's quite a few other things you can do as well. You can obviously build bee houses, which are, I'm sure you've seen the insect homes for sale there. They normally have lots of bits of wood with holes drilled in them. Um, so there's something that you could build yourself. All you need is some old logs or something like that. Drill holes of varying sizes in and bees will come in and uh, live in them. Just put it somewhere quiet, off the ground, not in direct sunlight, not facing sort of direct wind or rain, and, and they'll be quite happy. So it's easy enough to build these homes. I mean, I've started piling up branches in, in unused corners of my vegetable garden to provide bees and other insects a home because I've, I've started to realize there's a lot of other insects out there that are very beneficial as well. So, you know, the more we can do for all of them, the more we can help the entire ecosystem. Well, and that's a really important thing. You know, we as human beings think that bugs are bad. And when we take that attitude, we're basically killing all the bugs. And if we're doing that, we're killing all the good bugs and all the bad bugs. That, that's exactly the problem is we, we've gone a bit sort of crazy that, you know, bugs are bad and they're going to harm our plants or harm us or something like that. So we've indiscriminately started killing them. And things like ground beetles, the little black beetles or, or large black beetles that we often see running around a garden, they're actually really helpful because they'll go and eat slugs for us. And we, we all hate slugs because they eat our seedlings. But when we use insecticides, we're killing those as well as other things like ladybugs and lacewings, all of which are beneficial insects that eat things like uh, aphids, for example. Right. So one of the chapters in your book is about creating a bee-friendly neighborhood. Tell me about that. Right. Well, that, that's about working with your neighbors and the people that you live with to create a bee-friendly environment. If you're a member of a, a HOA or similar association, you can work with them and get them to start working with people to encourage the planting of flowers, to create bee homes, to reduce the use of, use of chemicals. I mean, I, I occasionally engage in what I, I refer to as guerrilla gardening, where nice. I take, take flower seeds and I go to unused patches of land and I go and scatter the flower seeds around. And I've been out already this year with snapdragon seeds. I, I had loads and loads from last year. So I've gone and put them into patches of land where there's just grass and nothing growing. I thought, right, I'll go and plant them and hopefully some of them will come up and we, we might get some flowers for our bees. Nice. When it's, I guess it's really a two-part system. Let me just make this up as we're speaking and see how I do. Number one is reducing the use of pesticides and herbicides. And number two is getting the pl flowers planted. That's, that's right. And it's also about planting the right sort of flowers for bees. We have these pretty double-headed flowers that you see, like um, some of the cosmos varieties and other plants. They have these really big, fuzzy double heads. And they can be quite difficult for some species of bee to get into because they can't get in, inside it to get the nectar. Mm -hmm. And some of the F1 variety vegetables that we grow, some of those, because they're sterile, they don't produce anything that's any use for the bees. So what really benefits the bees is planting some native plants to your area and allowing them to flower. So, for example, here I plant lavender, uh, which is native, marjoram, which isn't native, but the bees absolutely love it. I plant um, snapdragons and various other sort of native type plants. And what I do is I tend to keep some of them in, in containers and then I can move them around my garden. So when the apple trees come into flower, I move the containers over to under the apple trees. And then the bees come to the, are attracted to the flowers in the containers and then help me out by pollinating my apple trees at the same time. Nice. And really paying attention to what kind of seeds you're planting is, is important. When you talk about gorilla gardening, what comes up for me is we have some invasive non-natives here in Phoenix that are really taking over. So we have to be really conscious about the seeds that we are planting to make sure that they're native for our area. Absolutely. There's, uh, we, we've got a problem over here with uh, Himalayan balsam 
and amongst other things, and it's spreading like wildfire, and it crowds out all the native plants. But the problem with it is, is that the flowers in this plant, no good for the bees. The bees can't really eat it mm -hmm. uh, and, and use it. So what we we are all doing now is we're sort of being told if you see it somewhere, pull it up before it seeds, yeah. and then it gives the native plants a chance. So you, you, you do have to be careful. But the other thing people don't realize is there's actually some flowers which are toxic to bees. What kind of flowers are toxic to bees? Well, for example, rhododendron. That's, uh, that was popular in Victorian times. They, I think they brought it back from, I think it might have been Hawaii, and the Victorians planted it in the garden and it grew to massive size. But uh, the nectar from a rhododendron bush is toxic for bees, and the honey is also toxic to humans. So, oh, interesting. Uh, so a lot of the time, when the bees feed on certain flowers, it brings things back and the flat, it brings the toxins back from those flowers. So, for example, deadly nightshade or belladonna, if the bees feed on a lot of that, the resulting honey is also toxic to humans. Wow. And another one that's very dangerous to bees is California buckeye. Hmm. So the pollen's toxic to bees and that. Generally, bees will avoid it, but obviously if there's not a lot of choice, they try going for it. And the unfortunate with a lot of these is it doesn't just kill the bee that's picked up the, the pollen. They bring it back to the hive. They then tell other bees, hey, there's some pollen over here. And then they bring back enough that ends up actually killing the entire hive. Wow. I, I had no idea about that. Uh, yeah, there, there is quite a few. I, I, I have actually listed some of them in the book because, you know, again, you can think you're doing good planting. I, I know, say, stargazer lilies and thinking, oh, great, they look fantastic in my garden. The bees will love them. Well, the pollen of a stargazer lily, for example, is uh, deadly to bees. So you, you do have to be a, a little bit aware of what you're planting. Wow, no kidding. No kidding. I had no idea about that. That's interesting. So tell me about your book, Save Our Bees. You're guide to creating a bee-friendly environment well as i said it was inspired but after i moved into my current house and i realized how few bees there were in the environment and how few insects so i have a, a a patch of ground in front of my house that was just it was just mud so i decided to dig it all over and clean it up and i planted lots of flowers so i've got got primroses bluebells hyacinths there's some roses and there's quite a lot of other things in there. And I planted lots of sort of bedding plants as well and some foxgloves and snapdragons. And once they all started flowering, it was it really, really shocked me as to how many insects were suddenly right. all buzzing around the garden. Yep. It was like, wow, where did they all come from? So as I started looking into it and then I, I started to get to know some of the local beekeepers. I was talking to them about bees and they introduced me to all the problems bees are having. And I thought, this is something as a gardener, I need to be aware of and, you know, communicate out hopefully to other gardeners and help them realize that actually there's a lot we can do here to help these insects that are so very important to our survival. Amen to that. So what other books have you done? I've done a, a a few other books now. I can't remember exactly how many I'm up to. I, I just keep working on them. And the most recent ones have been about growing berries and about growing brassicas. So that's broccoli, cauliflower, horseradish, wasabi, and, and things like that. As well as that, I, I've done books on growing chilies, fruit, garlic, giant pumpkins, vertical, lavender. Vertical gardening. Vertical tomatoes. gardening, tomato, tomatoes, potatoes. <laughs> And one of my two two of my favourite books is I've done one about companion planting and one about canning and preserving. So they're um, quite interesting books to to read and use as well. Yeah, wow. Where can we find them all? What's your website? My website. There, all the books are listed on gardeningwithjason.com, and they're all available in print format or in electronic format. Nice. So you're a prolific writer. Are you also a prolific grower of things? And what do you do with all your stuff if you are? Yes, I, I have a tendency to grow rather a lot of stuff. I use, obviously, what I write about I use. So I use a lot of vertical gardening. I interplant. I succession plant. So I do end up producing quite a lot of, of plants. And I 
usually give them to if obviously if I haven't got if I can't use it all, I give them to friends and family. So it's not unusual for friends to to visit and go away with a bag of rhubarb, some garlic, and some onions, or or a bag of potatoes. Nice. I have a, this is kind of a two part question, and the first part is in two thousand and seven. Well, this is not a question. It's a statement. In 2007, I, they put me on the front cover of a magazine here in Phoenix. And the subtitle or the title on it, the, Extr- the Green Extreme, once kooky tree huggers are now green gurus. But would you want them for your neighbors? And <laughs> right. So they were kind of poking fun at what we were doing in 2007. And how do and it's come a long way since then we've you know we're we're rock stars now at least over here in the states what's it like for you over there what do your neighbors and and friends think about this well it's it's kind of similar because i say about sort of 15 years ago it was you know aren't you a bit young to be doing that you need to be over 70 to grow vegetables (laughs) right yeah you know it was it, it was almost something that people used to laugh at, but right over the, over the years, you know, particularly in recent years, it's become very very popular. We've got a lot of um, celebrity chefs over here that now grow their own produce, and they've been promoting that. There's a couple of restaurants that they they have sort of mini farms out the back, and they grow everything that they serve in the restaurant. And it's become something now that when I talk to people about it, I have a lot of interest. And I've had quite a few people in sort of the last sort of six to 12 months that when I've started to sort of said what I do, they've become very interested and sort of <laughs> nice. grilled me for information Yeah, because they, they've just started some vegetable gardens and trying to grow their own. And people start with, I don't know, some onions, tomatoes or some potatoes or something. And then they just sort of keep expanding and doing more and more. Well, and have you noticed with this whole COVID thing that people are really interested in growing their own food? I have indeed. Over, I don't know what it's like there, but over here, if you go into any of the shops that sell seeds, there are none yeah. on the shelf. Mm-hmm. All the seed websites over here uh, are telling you that it's a sort of two to four week delivery time if they've actually got it in stock. Most of the websites for seed websites now you have to queue to get into them to to be able to place an order. So people have gone really, really crazy for it. So hopefully it will really inspire people and people will keep it up. Amen to that. Amen to that. So do you have a new piece of advice for our listeners? What I can say is if, if you are just starting out growing, don't be afraid to make mistakes. Just give it a go. There's plenty of resources available. Obviously, you on, on, on your urban farm site have loads and loads of useful information. And at the end of the day, nature's been growing stuff for millions of years without human intervention. Right. So throw it in the ground and give it a go. The worst that will happen is it's not going to grow. And if all goes well, up it'll pop and you'll, you'll get some fresh vegetables in the, uh, a few months. But I think people need to remember it's not instant. It can take, depending on the vegetable, anything from several weeks to several months before it's right. So just be patient and basically enjoy it and have fun. Nice. Well, thank you so much for joining us on the show again today, Jason. My pleasure. Thank you ever so much for having me. I've really, really, really enjoyed myself. It's been great to talk to you again. Right back at you. And how can our listeners find you and buy your books? Right. It's easy enough to find me if you... Fire up your internet browser and you just go to gardeningwithjason.com. You can find me on there and you can find all my books. You can contact me through there or you can contact me on social media where on Twitter and Instagram, I'm at allotment owner. And that's all linked to from my website. Beautiful. You can find show notes from today's podcast at urbanfarm.org forward slash Jason Bees. Jason was also our guest on podcast episodes 443 and 492, as well as being a guest presenter at our Edible Backyard Summit. We hope you enjoyed today's episode of the Urban Farm Podcast. Remember to listen for tips, advice, and resources to help you on your journey with urban farming. You can find us on the web at urbanfarm.org or send us an email to podcast at urbanfarm.org. In the words of Vincent Van Gogh, great things are done by a series of small things brought together. 
Be encouraged that with each lesson learned and skill developed, you are one step closer in the direction of your dreams.